Ready to go? Thank you. <clears throat> so the plan is to just give you a couple of slide summary, uh, which really gets the, to the guts of, uh, of where we've got to. Uh, so just bear with me. This is only going to take a few minutes to sort of go through. And then really the rest of the time, we're just going to open it up for some discussions. There, there is a heck of a lot of implications behind some of the, well, most of the components of what we are going to be discussing. And it would be really interesting to see if some of those things uh, were kicked around a bit afterwards in the discussion. <clears throat> I clicked the button. Is it the bottom one or the top one? I press the top one. Oh. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> We could manually do it. There's only not that many slides. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, first of all, that's the, the team, and I figure Arthur and I have often discussed this. Um, we figure there's probably at least two person years each that we've put into this project so far. So I think, and there were a couple of people also that were involved in the early days who probably put in at least half of that, I would think. Um, and uh, I really have to hand it to the team for the dedication over that period of time. I quite often say this project, in, I'm retired, been retired now for two years. In my history of working in research and in data management, this project has been the longest and the most complex that I've ever been involved in, probably close to an order of magnitude. So anyway, my thanks to Arthur, Paul and John. And we're hoping that John is actually online. Uh, he wasn't able to make it from his home in Argentina uh, to this meeting, but he's an incredibly important part, as you can well imagine, of this, uh, of this group. Um, the significance, of course, of Darwin Core is absolutely fundamental to the nature of the um, work that we've been doing on data quality. We had to limit the scope in the early days and that did seem one way of at least limiting one dimension. So I really have to thank my partners for the perseverance in this project. Nope. <laughs> it is not advancing. Can you just manually do it? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, and the next slide will do. So as I'll follow the abstract. Oh my God, that's unreadable. <clears throat> okay, I'll just have to see what I can do. I'm going to just oh, the trouble my Switch the lights off, I guess, for a while, and I'll see if I can read it. Oh, right. Good point. <clears throat> Is this one? Ah, oh, yes, this one's on. Good. Okay. So the solid base we're building upon, I'll read it out just because you probably won't be able to read it. Um, the, the work that we've been doing is really based upon the task group one, which is the uh, fitness for use framework. The work for that is completed. Um, there is a publication which in fact links at least TG1, TG2 and TG3. So that's the uh, framework, our work on uh, data quality, uh, Tests, and here it is here actually, uh, task group three on data quality use cases. Again, that has also circumscribed the nature of the work that we've done. <coughs> so we certainly didn't uh, sit down independently and dream, dream a lot of this stuff up. Um, as I mentioned earlier, key point is we have based the work on Darwin Core occurrence records. And one of the key outcomes um, I think best, well, it was summarized uh, in, a, uh, in an online uh, community gathering, international gathering, probably by Tim Robertson from GBIF, who said, we think the specifications you have done for the data quality tests are something that we will absolutely and utterly embrace. We may not implement all the tests that you have come up with, um, but we will certainly use the specifications for those tests. 
And I think that is really fundamental to the work that we've done. And boy, those specifications have not been easily won. And there is a lot behind some of them that uh, might not be obvious to people. Uh, yeah, the multiply by three. We started the project in 2014. Um, the other two main players who had a significant input in the early days were Paula Samoglio, John's partner in uh, Argentina. And she's kicked off one of the first outcomes of this group, uh, which was to recognize that the wonderful flexibility of Darwin Core also is one of its biggest problems. In other words, we could not properly evaluate data quality because there were so few control vocabularies. That is just one of the sort of things that we woke up to fairly early, early in the piece. So Paula has in fact started up task group four to deal, start dealing with these, uh, the most significant vocabularies that it would be needed to improve what we might be able to say about data quality. <coughs> and Alex Thompson, who was with iDigBio, who went to Google, did he not? Um, I think so. Um, Alex had uh, a tremendous amount of input in the early days, so we certainly acknowledge his input. And we also acknowledge a host of GitHub commenters, and uh, a couple of those are in the room, and we immensely appreciate it. We apologize profusely about sometimes the massive amount of posts you might get <laughs> uh, if you subscribe to the task group. But um, please continue to do so. And uh, if something comes across your desk that you think may be relevant, please um, throw a comment into the GitHub issue. Um, each one of the tests, for example, for those of you that aren't aware of it, is a GitHub issue. Okay, and there's a whole series of other ones as well you would have seen. Um, right. Yeah, and the one thing we certainly learnt was face-to-face <laughs> -face meetings beat the crap out of Zoom. You know, even though the four of us know one another pretty darn well, in fact, we knew each other pretty well before we started, that made it a lot easier interacting, but boy, it doesn't make up for face-to-face -face meetings. We had one of those in... Um, uh, um, 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 where was that, Arthur? No. Oh, uh, Gainesville. Yeah, we had one good meeting in Gainesville where we did probably 50% of the work in this, uh, in this area. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, oh boy, can't read that at all. Um, so, okay, we still have 99 tests. We've actually got rid of a few and we've added a few, <laughs> but we still have 99. That wasn't planned, that's just how it's worked out. Importantly, the tests are agnostic about data control, uh, quality control and quality assurance uses. Okay, the tests are agnostic about the framework for execution, which is something that Paul can elaborate upon both aspects of that. Um, it's described by 19 test terms, which I kind of like to call the specifications, but Paul will probably wrap me around the ears for calling it that. Um, an example of just one of those um, uh, terms would be the test type. So we have 66 tests which are really validation type tests, uh, 25 which are actually amendments. Uh, I'll give you one example. We, uh, things have come up recently that many of you have seen about uh, from Marcus Doring about the significance or scope of taxon ID. <laughs> and. Uh, we actually considered taxon ID to be the primary taxonomic um, per, uh, uh, field. Let's just call it that for the moment. So we actually have an amendment which will create a taxon ID from scientific name. I think, yes, I'm pretty sure we do. All we're really saying is, um, in that case, taxon ID has primacy. Um, so the recent discussions by Marcus Doring might be something we... Uh, we might want to discuss here, but there is an unconference uh, topic upon this, and I think it's extremely significant. So for those of you that are interested in these things, I would urge you to um, support that. Um, <clears throat> we actually have a thing, uh, a set, uh, three tests which you actually fall into the category of being issues. In other words, there's a, it's essentially raising a flag 
um, something, some, we think there's something you should be aware of here. It's not an error as such, it's just something, it's, it's almost like a warning, I guess, in some ways. <clears throat> and then we've got a, a set of what we call measures, which are in some ways a summary. So that just gives you one idea about one of the fields. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And this is just an example of one of the tests. So it's validation year in range. We've got a, a, a human readable uh, description. Is the value of DWC year within the parameter range? And parameters in capital P's because a capital P because it's very specifically defined here. So the, the test type is a validation. The Darwin core class it refers to as an event. The information elements that are acted upon is Darwin Core Year. Uh, the expected response, we're calling it that, uh, is, is, if you like to think of it, the programmer's um, way of interpreting how this test is to be implemented. Okay, so internal prerequisites not met if DWC Year is not present or is empty or cannot be interpreted as an integer compliant if the value of DWC year is within the range, BDQ, that's our namespace, uh, earliest valid date to BDQ, latest valid date inclusive, otherwise it is not compliant. So that's a formal, if you like, specification of the test for programmery type people. So <coughs> the data quality dimension, which is a part of the framework, is it's a conformance test. The parameters you saw up here, earliest valid date, latest valid date. Um, right. And, sorry? Uh, yeah, we do. Earliest valid date, 1582. Latest valid date, current year. <clears throat> um, the specification last updated, and then there's examples, and the examples are taken actually directly from the test data set, which we use to exercise the tests and to test the validity of the tests. So these are taken directly from that. Um, the source we've put down, because we often, we occasionally forget where the idea of this test came from. Um, example implementations. And this is in Paul's category, a link, link to the source code, which Paul has written. And then notes regarding something that we think you should probably know about that may not be apparent from what you see above. Uh, I'll read it out because I think it's quite, you get a flavor of the sort of issues we ran across. The results of this test are time dependent. Next, next year is not valid now. Next year, it will be. <laughs> the test provides the option to designate lower and upper limits to, uh, to the year. The upper limit, if not provided, should default to the year when the test is run. This test provides for a default earliest date, year of 1582 by convention. That value was chosen because of ISO 8601-1 asserts that the use of the proleptic Gregorian calendar dates prior, to, I won't even go on, but you get the drift of the sort of thing we were up against. Uh, Gregorian calendars and whatever came into the conversation at one point. Uh, next slide, thanks. The other, we've got a, the specifications for the test is one significant, if you like, uh, rung of the stool that everything sits upon, the vocabulary which Arthur has really pushed very strongly and led is, is uh, a very important other component. Um, <clears throat> so this is just an I, one example from the vocabulary. So let's just take the term validation. It's the namespace term uh, with the um, namespace in front of validation in this case, and then a definition, the context, and any other comment. So we have that for how many terms have we got in the vocabulary, Arthur? About 150 terms. This is all in GitHub. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the validation data, which I'm sort of been the one largely pushing and developing uh, and pulling my hair out over. <laughs> there were days there when Paul would come back to me and say, well, this one isn't right. But then there are days when the test is actually, sorry, the data has really brought the test into question. 
equally. So it's been a real feedback loop that we go, oh, we didn't expect that, or what about this? So it's been a loop between the test data and the test implementation. Uh, so it is quite significant. So this is, again, this is um, on GitHub. <coughs> We've got a standard, you, you can think of it as a set of columns where every record um, is one test record. The columns are these sort of things. So what, what is the test that this thing applies to? What's the data ID, which is a unique ID um, for that particular test record? Um, it's internally in that particular test. Um, this is the ninth record. That's so it's just internal. Um, so here's the input data. Day is 30, month to year 1952. And the formal response is run has a result. Response result, not compliant. And response comment, day is not in range. So this is the sort of thing we, the test data contains. Next slide. <coughs> so directions, last slide. Complete the coding of the tests, of which we're totally dependent upon Paul for that, <laughs> who's been doing a great job. Uh, so finish test implementations. I think that's probably the same thing. Uh, Refine the specifications of the data um, if that's needed. Finalize the documentation. The documentation is actually sitting on GitHub that's going to form the standard. That's sitting as a GitHub issue, so you can all see it uh, and comment upon it. Uh, then we identify a review manager, and that's going to be a tricky one. Uh, and then I might be able to retire properly and open a bottle of champagne. Look, I think that gives you a bit of an idea on where we've got to. So uh, next slide should be end. Yeah, right. So we're just going to open the floor up, Arthur. Just one brief thing there. The validation data is for use for anybody implementing these tests in their own data sets, in their own database. It's You run the, the tests, run the tests against that validation data, and it will tell you whether that information is working, whether those tests are working on your system. It's agnostic to whatever system you use, whether it's CSV or Fox Pro or Oracle or whatever you want to use. And, uh, but when you run it, run those tests against the validation data, it should give the same result as what the, the tests are telling you it should give. One thing that Arthur sort of reminded me of as well is that there is no doubt for those of you that would look at the test that there are some tests in there which we would call aspirational. Uh, in other words, we've recognised we've taken the opportunity to kick people up the bum, basically, and on issues like do you have licence filled in, <laughs> yeah, basic things like that, but probably more even uh, a better example might be there is an annotation against this record. Be aware of it. The hassle is, of course, that we do not have a um, feedback. <clears throat> there is uh, no uh, Tadwig at the moment. Um, Paul's lead, you, well, you're leading the annotations interest group. But are you? So there is a implementation of an annotation system in, in Europe um, that's linked to, to JBIF, um, but not you know, widely globally used, um, but sort of saying, yeah, we know annotations are important. Here's a, a test that's tying to them, even though they're not widely used in the wild yet. One of the things Lee didn't mention was all our tests are uh, what we call core tests. Um, they're the tests that we believe are implementable on the Darwin core fields. We don't have tests against every Darwin core field. Um, they're the ones that we think are implementable. We have some non-core tests, uh, ones that we found difficult to implement or 
Um, we didn't think they were that important that maybe not everybody's using them at the moment. Um, and they're there with the structure that Lee showed. They're there if anybody wants to develop these into a, a stand, part of the standard, they can. They've got the framework there of how you do it, all the fields and everything. Um, and then we've got, I don't know, four or five uh, tests that we are, say, say are non-implementable uh, at this stage. Uh, either the vocabularies aren't suitable to implement those types of tests. Um, one of these is the uh, geographical hierarchy, because if you use TGN and some of those, they're not consistent uh, throughout it. So we don't believe that that test should be implemented at this stage. Eventually, when better vocabulary is available, that could come right in. But they're written there, they're in the GitHub, but they just have a a label that they're uh, not to be implemented. Yeah, that relates to something I think is very significant to our work too, and that is we have a, um, one of the fields in the test is source authority. Uh, and the namespace is specifically BDQ source authority is. In some cases it may point to say GBIF at the moment, but that's uh, quite often to a parameter which can be user adapted. For example, if you wanted to check the taxonomic information against a national or local database that we've taken account of. I think we'll open it up for discussion at this stage. I think you've got, if please, questions and um, any comments uh, would be greatly welcomed at this stage. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, um, my question is about how you're going to extend the, the tests in the, in the future. Um, as you probably know, in DISCO we are working on digital specimens, uh, for which we are trying to, to harmonize as many fields as possible for the, from the CMSs. Um, basically, we use Darwin Core fields by default, but this, if there are no Darwin Core fields, then uh, we, we use ABCD. If there's no ABCD, we use OpenDS. Um, so it may be that, for instance, in the future we want to have a few additional tests for, for ABCD fields that are not currently in, uh, in, in mm -hmm. BDQ. How could we extend that so, to um, the procedure? So I think that takes us back to the first three task groups. So um, task group one was Alan Koch Viega's work on developing a framework for defining statements about data quality. And so we've, we've based things on, you know, the vocabularies you're seeing there are coming out of that standard, the data structures we're using and more complexly that you didn't see here for, that's getting to what specification means. Um, so there's, there's underlying complexities tied to the, the standard that we, glossed over here, but sort of, there's a framework for describing data quality in a formal way. So it's test group one. So that's sort of the underlying basis for extension is anybody can define a test using that framework and you know, plug it into the, the system because it fits with all the rest of the tests. Test group three, is the thing that really defined core for us. Task group three was going out and looking at uses of biodiversity data in the wild and collecting user stories and saying, what are the important pieces? And so that really defined core for us as a set of Darwin core terms. Um, so we've sort of taken that, this is the reason why we've put in the specific set of tests we have, basically. Using flat Darwin core, what taxon occurred where, when, plus some, some really necessary metadata. Um, more me. Uh, Dave Watts, Overs Australia and CSIRO. 
I was just wondering if there's any thought about how this information gets transmitted around the network of things, because as I'm a significant data provider, I don't want to put in 10 million test records for a million occurrences. Um, so I understand the question, Dave. Well, if I have a, a, an occurrence record and I applied 10 tests, how those 10 tests get inscribed in the data streams? And if I have a million records, does that mean 10 million tests have been advertised? Or current or record results of ten million tests. So in essence, yes. Um, for for a record, the um, the these set of tests are running on that record and making about a hundred assertions about that record. Um, we will be. We haven't yet, because it's basically trivial, defining a set of additional measures that lets you talk about your entire data set, summarizing across those. Um, we're completely agnostic about where you fit this into your data pipelines. We're completely agnostic about how this is you know, linked to the environment. Um, by you know, defining things within framework that's stating things in RDF, we would tie really naturally to the WC3 annotation framework and you know, make annotations on the data um, or annotation conversations on the data, but that's not necessary. You can put in wherever it makes sense and the earlier the better. Yeah, thanks Paul. There are we didn't state it explicitly, but there was a strong intention right from the word go for these tests to be actually deployed in the field wherever possible. That will certainly be happening more and more into the future. So in other words, right from the data collection phase, right through the aggregation phase. Um, there was another point there too. God. Sorry, oh well, publishing phase, yes, um, agreed. Oh, no, it skipped my mind at the moment. It might come back to me. Um, any other? Comments. Oh, sorry, I know what it was. Uh, Paul was only um, one third the way correct because <laughs> each record, in fact, gets three passes. Um, we pass validations over the tests. We then pass potential. Just move away from that screen. Yes. <laughs> potential amendments. In other words, we can see if we can actually amend the data. For example. Can we generate a taxon ID from the taxonomic information in the record? Then we revalidate that same record. In other words, we rerun the validations again. Okay, so <laughs> it's three times worse. In other words, every record gets a triple pass. Okay, um, yeah, but look, eh, it's happening all the time and it's happening ad hoc. All we're doing, the original intent was to come up with a standard set of tests which will give you a bit of an indication about the data quality, you know, fitness for use, which is obviously a better term here. So what Lee just described of three passes as an ideal way of doing things. You validate the data before Attempting to amend the data, you say, what happens if we accept all the proposed amendments, revalidate, and see how much the, the quality of the fitness for use has, has improved? Um, but that isn't a necessary part of the framework. That's just a, a good way of running the tests. Thank you. Um, I guess this is addressed to all three of you gentlemen. Have you considered, I guess you could call it a score for data sets, and how would that score, that data quality score, look, and what would it be based on? There are actually a couple of the measures. No, no, you, you can deal with the measures at least initially. Oh, that's right, the fact that we're dealing with a single record and aggregated the yeah. Um, so let's start with the 99 tests themselves are all single records. So they're all assertions about a single record. Um, the framework also allows us to define tests that 
talk about well, what the framework calls a multi-record, a data set that has more than one thing in it, and summarize information across that. And for that, it uses measures. Measures can do one of two things. Measures can either return a number. So you could have a measure that produces a metric that says, yeah, how much of this data set has had all of the validations return compliant? Um, you can also have measures defined that basically return either a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And those go back to two fundamentally different ways of looking at data quality processes. One is data quality control, where you're saying, I want to improve the quality of my data set. And the other is data quality assurance, where I say, I want to filter down the data to data which is fit for my purpose. And so you define a measure that says, basically, all of the validations have passed, it comes thumbs up. And then you filter down the data set until you get that measure saying, yes, these, these records are all good. Um, and so in the, in the quality assurance framework, in the quality assurance realm, the framework has a, a formal way of doing that. Um, in the quality control realm, which is really measure of fitness of this data set for purpose. Um, yes, it's entirely possible to frame aggregations of, you know, count, counts of how many of the validations um, were compliant, how many were non-compliant. Um, so, so. Can I extend, uh, explain my question a little better? I've been looking at uses of GBIF mediated data especially in species distribution modeling, and where the authors have been kind enough in their modeling study to explain what criteria they use to filter the GBIF data, I found a lot of variation and also some consistency. And I thought, well, yeah, there could be a score here which you could put in and say, um, this data set is level two. I can use it. That's what I meant. But because the, the different choices of um, filtering objects, like are these suspicious coordinates, is the taxon name correct, those sorts of things, vary so much. I wondered, how could you come up with a single score? Well, you, you can't because it, right from the word go, all of us recognized one record or a group of records that are suitable for one application and the person would love it would be totally unsuitable for somebody else. Even if those two people were working in species distribution models, that is the real problem. Um, as I think Paul pushed the point about us being agnostic about it, I mean, we really did work very hard in the early days of covering what we considered to be the main dimensions and Paul, I think, mentioned it effectively, name, space, and time. And we just have another category called other for covering Darwin core fields like license. We needed to cover those, we recognized. Um, but there was a, certainly a recognition that we would simply produce the raw material for, you know, for people to then utilize in the context that they were operating in. I cannot, we've never pushed towards a single number. We have four measures or five of which I think three or four of them are in fact the summary of how many validation tests were um, compliant. So, but you, there's nothing stopping anyone from taking these measures because that, that's what they would use and using those to produce some sort of a data quality score for their purposes. <laughs> Okay, um, I think that'd be basic, but homing in on, say, specific fields, you're back 
into where do you place the emphasis, I guess. We were very, very careful to ensure that we would cover name, in other words, the name of the critter or whatever, the location of it and the time of the um, observation or whatever or the sampling. Um, and that was, that was basic, I guess, to it. But no, a single number, I think, for a specific purpose, I would say yes, but it's not the sort of thing that we're going to produce because it's too complex to pay for. Yeah, it really comes back to that fitness for use. Um, so much data is, is good for one purpose, not for another. And the sum of the measures, and I know Paul would really like to get into multi-record testing and, and measures, but it's something that's been outside our scope at the moment. Um, and perhaps you could do a series of measures and there's nothing to stop anybody building on what we've got here. We know it's not complete. It's what we could do in 10 years of work um, to get those 90 solid tests that we know will work. But there are lots of other tests and a lot of specific tests for particular uses that people could add in. And we're not stopping anybody from adding extra tests in or taking the draft non-core tests that we have and working those up for their particular use. But they won't form the key part of the BDQ core standard. Um, and, but as I say, there's nothing to stop other people doing it. And if your particular work is uh, doing data modelling and you only want data of a certain uh, uncertainty in the geocoding, um, et cetera, then you can set those parameters in your test. And one of the things that we didn't talk much about was setting those parameters. If you're working in Australia and the elevation, maximum elevation, minimum elevation, you don't want the height of Mount Everest there. You only want a, you know, a much lower um, elevation, maximum elevation. So you can set that so that you can pull out any elevation that's above that if you know the records in Australia. The same as you don't want the deepest holes in the, in the, um, in the Antarctic, um, whereas our lowest piece of land is minus 30-something metres. So you can set the minimum or the maximum depth, etc., in water. So, and for example, with the datums, if you're, um, our default is the EPS G4326, uh, WGS84. Um, but if you're working in South America, if you're working in Brazil, they have it legislated that they have to use the South, the South American datum, SAD. So you can set that in your parameters so that then you're using that and when you do the validation, it'll check that and then it'll do it with the amendment so that it'll add that in rather than EPSG 26. Yeah, uh, the, um, uh, I'm Eric Chenin from um, the Paris Museum. And um, I'm wondering whether all this approach on uh, data quality applies to, uh, to traits, to descriptive uh, characteristics. We are working on, on the, the herbarium um, uh, of uh, Paris and other museums in France. Uh, we have about 8 million um, images of digitized specimens. And um, in this corpus, so far, we can only navigate and search uh, with the Latin name, uh, the large area like uh, Western Africa, I think, of collection and the date of collection, and, and that's all. So we are working on analyzing uh, the images to extract traits, uh, descriptive characteristics of, of the leaves, of flowers, and, and things, uh, and um, uh, so that the, the users can navigate and search using these traits. And my, my question would be how um, this quality assurance approach or quality control approach uh, can apply to such traits, such uh, data? My first reaction would be that I would, we would love you to base any work upon the principles of what we've done. The specifics 
because we're so Darwin core based, you know, that's moving outside our bailiwick, so to speak, outside of our domain. But like Tim Robertson said, what we would really appreciate is the descriptive aspects of what we've done should be applicable to data quality more generally. In other words, whatever test you come up with, we would like to see something called an expected response, which is, in other words, a programmatical description of exactly what this test does that could be understood by a programmer when implementing this test. Things like a source authority, that would still be appropriate. Parameterization, when you're diff dealing with different file, for example, you might have totally different parameters regarding the traits. So again, that would be applicable. So that example I gave you, the, le the terms in the left hand, we would love, uh, it is still applicable. You know, most of those are still gonna be applicable to you. So we would really urge for you to examine those and use them wherever possible. That, that would be my comment, Paul. Be... And, and amplifying on that, it, it's the formal framework for defining the tests is you can just take that and use it and define tests that do different things for your own different data quality needs that will you know seamlessly integrate with the kinds of tests that we've done for core purposes on on flat darwin core and and the same using the same terms like compliant not compliant and and those sorts of things because that they're now standard terms that in, in the vocabulary that we want people to follow and use the same terminology and then that fits in with the um but the annotation the response you've got the three types of response um levels um response result <laughs> response status etc um which fit into the w3c annotation system so it's compliant with that so um, it's extensible from that point of view. And annotations can be annotated, for example. Hi, uh, Henry Engeldorf from Mesa Botanic Garden. Um, so maybe I'm sort of just fishing in bad ground here, but or bad waters, but I have a date, I validate it, and the date is fine as far as the date is concerned. I have a collector, and that gets validated on whatever authority source. I'm finding a lot of the data I'm having to deal with at the moment are combination factors. Is that date valid for that collector? And then maybe also incorporate that with a locality or a country because if the three are not congruent, then one of the three aspects are, are wrong. Um, and that's more the sort of work that I'm sort of using at the moment to to try and, but I normally do it project by project because I find there's a lot of manual cleaning. I can find where the problems are, but I can't know which aspect of the three is wrong. So are these tests eventually gonna be answering those sort of combination effects? We have a, a very small number that deal with things like that, not that particular case. But there's, there's Peter, there's a, a good data set developing that could be used for um, saying, okay, we have a an agent who is a collector. So it got recorded by, we can tie that recorded by to, or recorded by ID, either one, we could tie that to a record that has, you know, age, you know, um, year of birth, year of death. Now ask, do, dates that we have associated with that collector fit sanely within the thing that's that's that would be straightforward to define given a, a a data set or a service that can be called upon um, that particular test we don't we don't have in the the uh, in the set of core tests right now but it again given given the right sort of service real straightforward to implement if if the vocabularies are linked and that data is available then it's possible to write the code and write the, a test to do that um, using the same structured format um, 
but I don't think, certainly Lee and I won't be involved in further <laughs> building new tests on that, but we encourage anybody else to do it. Once we've got the structure and the test and the format there, anybody building new tests would be fantastic. I think yours is just a probably more easy to deal with issue than the traits. Um, and I think it's very easily implementable because you're you're looking at Darwin Core anyway. So as long as you stick with the framework that we've actually used for describing it, it's not a difficult thing to implement. Right from the start, we always said this is the core group. And in special contexts, you know, one of the example I used is, well, you know, if you're dealing with sort of OBIS data, you know, it's quite useful probably to have a test that sort of checks depths against, you know, Jebco or something like that. But we haven't got that because we just thought it might have been a bit specific for the context that we were dealing with. And you're, you've got another example, and I think it's a fabulous example. And you can, you can look at the 99 tests, and it'll be very obvious to you how to, to create a test on the basis of what we've done. And it would be highly appropriate for your environment to do so. And what I would like to see, obviously, is that becomes a part of the standard for a certain community. Oh. <laughs> yep, next. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, Shantara L from the Bishop Museum in Honolulu. Um, yep. I just wanted to ask about what the plans for the original uh, implementation for this are, and kind of what paths you have going forward for implementing this in, in different ways. Um. I've been well building off of work that came out of the filtered push project and then into the curator project. Um, I've been refining a set of, of Java implementation of the test, and we got about three quarters of them um, with with implementations that validate against the, the validation data. And in OBIS, um, they've been also implementing, and uh, we're, we're hoping to work more closely with them on uh, run, running against uh, the validations. Um, yeah, there's, there's been a, a really valuable feedback loop in the developing the tests of, okay, we say, here's what we think the test should be. Leah goes off and creates some validation data. I go off and create an implementation, and we run the implementation against the validation data, and we go, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> So sometimes it's an issue in the validation data, sometimes it's an issue in the implementation, sometimes it's taking us back to basic principles about the, the test. Um, that's been a, a really valuable part of the process. We are hopeful, and we had some early discussions with uh, some of the database builders like Specify and um, Symbiota, et cetera, on building the structure into their databases so that then anybody implementing that, because we would really like to see this done at the database level, not when it gets to GBIF or when it gets to the Atlas of Living Australia. The sooner we can get that data clean, the better, the cheaper um, it, it is and less of a problem. So um, I think Lee Ming, who's up the back there, is talking later in the week about her implementing some of this into OBIS, which is fantastic to see happening. And I think there are a couple of other people. I think somebody's been implementing it in R. Um, and so there's a couple of people started doing it, and it's good to see the start. And I was talking to, I can't see, here's some people from Pensoft oh, up the back there, and they're talking about um, implementing it against uh, the Darwin Core archive with respect to their publishing system. So. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Okay, awesome. <laughs> um, well, when I was uh, working with the Opus to implement to, to decide on the parameters for the test. One of the 
one of the questions that we have is how how to come up with a good quality flag because for example in GPF and Obis if we have issues issues flag right like compliance and non not compliance it's difficult for users to to filter for data for example so for example if i have records where the event date is filled in based on year month day how can i uh, how could uh, aggregators like obis or databases put a good flag there like i wonder if you have any advice on that because uh, in my humble opinion if many people goes to GBIF and and obis or, and other aggregators and they actually run the same test but they have a different label different data quality flags mm -hmm. it could be a little bit confusing um, and I think it would be a, a great idea if you could like help to guide this. Yeah, Thank you. I, I think that very much is is what the framework and the vocabularies and the formal test specifications are about, is trying to get everybody on the same page about what our tests are doing and how we're describing the results. Um, so, I, you know, it was, Tim Robertson said the the really important piece here is the framework for description, even more than the, the particular tests, and and that extends to the you know the vocabularies. The other key piece is, well, I like to phrase it as flags are not enough. That the the formal structure we have for a a response has at least three parts. So it has a status that tells us, was the test able to be run or not? Were the kinds of issues when the test was run ones that would be permanently fatal? Or, OK, the service we're trying to query was down right now. And try again later, you'll get a different result. Um, so the status, separate from the value, the actual result. So was this validation compliant? Was this validation not compliant? And so that that operates somewhat like a flag, but they're not all binary. Um, and then third, probably the really most important piece is the human readable comment of we say that your data did not pass this test because um, and that that provides for the interpretation and so in you know, the formal specification we've got the the human readable description of what it is this test is intended to do there is also in the response comment a statement about exactly why your particular record got the particular result it did. Um, so the, those are you know, the real important pieces about making this intelligible to whatever the consumers of the, the data quality reports are. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have just another question uh, on the traits that are usable for uh, navigating and searching within the digitized uh, herbarium collection. And my question would be, um, would you have any recommendations on how we could organize uh, the discussion with the potential end users so that we can identify which traits are the, are the most useful. So it's a point of view of fit for use. Uh, which traits are, are the most useful and which uh, traits we should prioritize when we work on extracting the traits from, from the images? Clear? I think there's a traits interest group in Tadwick. Um, there's, a, there's an interest group looking at traits. Uh, and it's probably worth joining that group and having discussions with them. Uh, there's a lot of people in, in Brazil have been involved with that and, and they've met 
most meetings, but I don't think some of the key people are at this meeting. But that's one worth looking at. Yeah, again, the, the parallel with us with the, is also with the vocabularies. When I started looking at traits when I was involved in the Atlas work, that was one of the big issues. You just did not get people talking in the same language about the same characters. So, you know, from our work here, it was incredibly important to have here are the terms we are using and here is the definition of the terms in our context. I found it personally very difficult dealing, as Paul will attest, I had real problems in some of the terminology in the framework because they were generic terms. In other words, people had a tendency to just treat them as, you know, like in this case, plain English, whereas they had a very specific um, definition. And to me, well, still the most important thing is, okay, here is the vocabulary. Uh, and one thing we did not state, which we only really concluded, you know, a month or so ago, is that the standard that we will submit will be incorporating TG1, TG2, TG3, and one would even hope maybe aspects of TG4. And one of the main reasons for that is it provides a single framework, uh, particularly in relation to the vocabulary of terms. So that would be something I would push very, very strongly. One of the things we haven't mentioned and, and what Lee's saying there, has come about from our work through the thing. At the start, the, um, the framework was really pushed in the way of everything being positive. This data is positive for a particular use. Lee and I, when we were starting, were coming from the point of view of data quality of we want to find the errors. We want to find what's wrong with the data. So we were thinking in a negative point of view. Um, and so the fields were, um, you know, that it might have been validation day empty. So that was a negative point of view. But now we've changed it all around with lots of discussion and working, but we changed it around to the positive. So the positive is that day, the day field is not empty. So we use the term not empty rather than empty in a lot of our things. And there's a whole lot of other terms like that so we had to get, Lee and I particularly had to get our head around is to think always in the positive way of when we're doing these tests um, and rather than in the negative, trying to find the errors but trying to find what data is suitable for a particular use. And uh, you know, the, the framework is based on Ellen Cook Viega's formal set theory statements and um, late Bob Morris and um, um, David Lowry took that into um, an OWL representation. And uh, we've been working with that, refining that OWL representation. So that's part of what's behind the scenes and the, the formalities of the, uh, the test specifications. Quick, a quick comment about, about sourcing the errors and sorting it out. I make a conscious effort to make sure the data gets published as clean as possible because once it's out there, it's gone. The aggregators have already harvested it. People have downloaded it and got mistakes in it. So actually what I do is I, when I publish it, it goes to Ibis and GBIF immediately. I check, make sure they don't. there's nothing obviously wrong. And Ibis is quite good because it actually flags missing dates and stuff like that, and you look like, oh, I can't fix that, but I know it's been sorted and I know it's as best as possible at that point in time. So I think that goes to the importance of the earlier you get in the data quality testing and the earlier you get in the, the quality improvement, the better. Um, but you know, we're agnostic to where in that life cycle of the data you're setting, but earlier is better. We're hoping that every institution with a database will be running these tests before 
GBIF or ALA or anybody ever sees the data. But um, we know the reality of the situation and a lot of it will get uploaded and, um, and that's why using the W33C annotation, it's a way that we can feed back and then um, and I'll show in my talk on Friday some of the annotation that ALA is using and the annotations to the annotations they make when they, they make corrections or whatever. So I'll show some of that on Friday. So just a comment on what you were saying. Um, yeah, there, there are different levels of data cleaning. There's the one where you test for basic, obvious, logical errors. This can't be right, and those you can generally fix quite easily. But I know that in my data set, if I'm really honest, um, it's a lot of legacy data, it's a lot of old data, it's very varied. And I know where a lot of the errors are. I just know it's going to need humans to look at it to, or enough extra data to support it to have a complex question that you can ask the data and say, this is probably the right answer through a lot of iteration. Um, my philosophy is at the moment, we've got the data. I know a lot of it is messy. I'm going to throw it out there. Humans are going to look at it, see errors, and then report back to me and say, they can help me fix the data. So I don't mind putting out data that I know is wrong. There's certain collections we have, the names get confused, they've got the same name. And I know just for one collector, we have 2,000 records that probably need to revisit it and looked at because the one never collected in a certain country, so it probably needs to be switched but I'm not sure whether it was entered correctly in terms of the country or the collector. So a lot of these things need to be verified. Do you suggest that even if we suspect a record to be wrong, we flag it, we don't put it online, or we just put out the bad stuff and we, with the sort of, you know, proviso that this data is not clean, but hopefully with the future it will become cleaner and cleaner? Uh, this raises a, a perfect example that I ran across when I was asked by Donald to join the Atlas. Uh, it took me literally a year arguing with one of the senior programmers in the Atlas when they wanted, that person wanted to remove all of the suspect records from the public. And my response was over my bloody dead body for that very reason. It took me literally 12 months to convince them, and I convinced them with the argument that virtually like you said, I said, it's the Atlas's responsibility to get the data out there. We understand there's just a massive range of issues associated with you know, a fair proportion of the records, probably all the records in one form or another, but getting it out there publicly at least highlights the potential problems with it. Yes. <laughs> The downside to that is there's always potential misuse that the average, you know, um, species data modeler or something might go, give me all of the kangaroo species for Australia and I'm going to throw it into a model. There's always that. But I would still fight tooth and nail to get that data out there and make it public because then you've got a, bloody, a damn big community that are looking at it. I mean, I don't think I actually go into the atlas any time personally where I don't find a problem. I found a couple of species on the top of Mount Wellington when I took uh, four, three people from, well, actually four people from GBIF, if you include Donald, um, on the top of Mount Wellington. And to me, it was like, you know, I, get, I wasn't disgusted by that. I just thought, wow, I wonder why they put them up here. <laughs> it turns out it was a spatial, you know, error. But look, that would be the attitude that I would take. I think the tools that we have made are going to help at least identify the problems. I mean, does the ALA or GBIF or IDIG Bio or whatever or OBIS, you know, say, well, you know, when someone asks for the data, they give them some sort of results of our test, you know, like in a summary or something like that? Possibly, but that's beyond our scope, probably. <coughs> And that's one of the parts of the W3C, tongue tied on that one, the W3C annotation is that the annotation shouldn't disappear. If you run your, your data test and it says this is not compliant, 
and it's not compliant because of X, Y, Z. But then you as the database owner looks at it and says, oh, no, no, this is perfectly good. This is a real outlier in location or whatever, but it's a perfectly good record. Then you don't just delete the annotation. You say, this has been checked and um, it's found to be a good record because the next person that runs that data will run it and get the same result, hopefully, if they're following our standards. Um, so you don't want that. So if the data's out there and as it gets annotated, it might be out on GBIF or whatever, but it should have an annotation to so say this is not compliant and the reason. Now you as a user might say, well, I don't worry about that because it's not going to affect my use of the data so I can use it. But another person might say, oh, no, this is no good for my use and I'll ignore it. But once that annotation's there, the user can make up their own mind. You can't, we can't dictate to the users how they use data. It's up to the user to determine whether that data is fit for their particular purpose. Yeah, so you as you know, owner of a database of record have data quality concerns. And so you may say, you know, here's, a, here's an issue in my data. This is going to be trivial to, to fix. Here's another issue in the data. This is going to take person years of work to clean up. But using the same framework for that data quality control as a downstream research consumer is using for data quality assurance, you provide your data, they can easily filter out the things that are not fit for their purpose. Yeah, I'm uh, Knut uh, Hofstad from uh, Norwegian Biodiversity Information Center. And uh, I agree with the, the um, idea that we have to put the data out and get feedback on them, but we also want the data to be used. And uh, uh, in Norway, uh, we the data from GBIF or from the service that I'm working on, uh, the Norwegian Species Map Service, um, are used, for example, it's, it's piped directly into... Um, forest harvestry machines. So, and then we can't have errors in them. So <clears throat> this idea of annotating data with a um, sort of a fitness for purpose or uh, um, yeah, data quality, as, as information on data quality is extremely important. And I, I think there's a, a, a huge need for better standards for how to annotate data with uh, quality information uh, and the W3C is not enough at all I think we need much more than that yeah yeah at the moment all we've done is to recognize the significance of annotations so one of the tests just simply says there is an annotation on this record let the buyer beware it may be that that annotation could be I use this record in this context and found it great. So there's not, it would not only be the fact that there's an annotation of an error, it might be the annotation of a usage. But your point is taken. All we've done within the scope of what we've um, been able to do with the test is to say, there's an annotation. We suggest you have a look at what that annotation is. Sorry, I forgot to explain the reason I won the argument about exposing the data. The argument was, how would you think a, for example, scientist would react if you informed them that you as a programmer decided what data was fit for their purpose? That won the day. <laughs> So again, we're agnostic about exactly how data quality reports are presented. Um, so one kind of use is 
one, one kind of scenario is you present the data quality reports as a you know, detailed report that somebody works through. Another is you simplify it down to here is stuff that is, is fit for my purpose. Another is you take our formal assertions, you attach them to WC3 annotations, you attach them to the, the data records. And so the, the, the way in which we're making the assertions tied to a framework in OWL plays really nicely in that RDF world of the WC3 annotation model. Um, but it isn't. It isn't a requirement. That's a. That's a way that things can be done. One of the things we're hoping to do is try and put Bob Messerbot out of work. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just really basic questions. You. I heard annotation a lot, W3C annotation model. What is it? <laughs> How does people see the annotation from someone else? Uh, it's a basic question, then please enlighten me. Thank you. So the World Wide Web Consortium has a small set of standards for um, talking about basically annotating HTML documents. That was their scope. Um, and so they've got a, an annotation data model, and then they've got a, another specification for how you can transport, communicate things that are asserted in that, that data model. Um, the um, 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 project out of um, out of um, Berlin Herbarium. What am I thinking? Um, Anasys. Anasys, yes, exactly. Um, Anasys did an implementation of annotation system, and then moved it over to WC3's annotation model, and they have that integrated with. Um, um, with GBIF to, to some extent, so they're able to make annotations on data records within you know, a portion of the European community and serve those up to tied, tied to the records that are in GBIF. Um, yeah, clearly a kind of thing that's extremely relevant, clearly a kind of thing that um, we, we haven't yet got the community buy-in and infrastructure needed to do this on the, the really large scale we need. So, Walter. Yeah, we, we also implemented an annotation framework in DISCO and uh, currently our data model is under review. We based it on the W3C uh, annotation standard and um, the annotation standard uh, uh, makes use of selectors and you can extend uh, the, the standard with new selectors. So we, we added a selector for individual uh, fields in structured data, so you can annotate the individual fields and also classes. So uh, for instance, a locality or an identification as, as a class of a uh, set of fields that you can annotate. And you can annotate the whole object. So that's a way of doing, uh, doing that. Uh, one last question. Uh, were that annotation points to the HTML to, to the HTML page or to identifier of, of an object? A few more minutes yet. A few more minutes yet if anybody got any more questions. Otherwise yeah, um, feel free to um, come and speak to us about any aspect of it um, during the week. These guys will be around for the whole week. I won't. <laughs> um, but we'd be very interested to get feedback. Um, you can do that with us now, or you can certainly do it on GitHub. As I said, we everything that anyone pops onto our area in GitHub, we certainly see it and react to it. And we've really appreciated the feedback we've had so far. So... 
Tadwig BDQ GitHub. On the Tadwig, it's got a whole lot of GitHub. This is the BDQ for one of the data quality. So you find it in there, you'll find all sorts of other information in that GitHub. <coughs> this is the wiki where we're trying, where we're writing the standard at the moment, and if anybody's got comments on that, we're trying to provide them to us. And all the tests are in the GitHub, along with ones that we have written that aren't implementable, uh, ones that we say are non core which we call supplemental. Uh, supplementary, uh, but they're there for tags and uh, issues in GitHub. Yeah, the vocabulary is there as well. Uh, it's just one GitHub issue, and like GitHub, you'll see the vocabulary at the top. Like the test, you'll see the test specification at the top, and then underneath that, all the comments that relate to that information. So it's publicly available. Will we round up? Yeah, look, I've really appreciated um, you coming. Um, it is very valuable for us. Um, I keep saying we're 99.9% .9 of the way there, but I said that about four years ago. Um, but this time I think we are really getting close. Um, and we would really value, if you want to um, look at anything, look at the building standards document. It's got a little table of contents at the, at the front, so have a look at the bits and even that maybe interest you and make any comments. We would certainly appreciate that. That's one of the key tasks for us to do now. So what's remaining, as I said before, is the implementation of the remaining tests, which I think are the geography, some of the geography ones, right? Um, then running it against the test data, which is already there, and then probably refining the tests if necessary in the specifications, and then finish this standards document off. And there's discussions that Paul's, sorry, Oh yes, and if anyone's got any good ideas of a review manager, we'd be very keen to hear about it. Um, because we sort of started thinking about that about six months ago, and uh, one or two names come up, but we're not sure yet. Well, thank you very much for coming. Um, it's really appreciated. I hope you've learnt a bit about what we have been doing on the whole data quality area. Um, but we'd value further feedback, most definitely. Have, enjoyed, have a good lunch. <laughs>